my name is Mike Gaben and welcome to my KSP campaign. What we have here is a 36.1 meter per second correction to tweak my even counter. This here is actually the Moho 3, but I'm actually on my way to Eve. Now, this was launched back in episode 114. And uh, during the time when I was setting up my encounter to get down to Moho, I noticed that if I left a little bit early, that I could get myself an Eve encounter. And seeing the fact that this probe was actually packed with 14 kilometers per second of Delta V, I figured I could afford the Eve flyby and uh, make this kind of a twofer. Unfortunately, I wasn't paying enough attention to my contract at the time. And the contract that I had set up for this required me to return back to Kerbin after rendezvousing with a vessel in Moho. Now, after this burn was completed, uh, I, took, I looked at trying to tweak my encounter with Eve and uh, even trying to see if I could just miss Eve entirely to try and make this less expensive. No, no matter what I did, I ended up with requiring a three kilometer per second burn at my Eve closest approach. To get my moho encounter and that all had to do with leaving early uh it seemed like once i made that early departure time i was committed to this particular path on top of that my capture at moho is going to be expensive because i'm coming in towards moho at a pretty steep path relative to moho's orbit so i'm thinking rendezvousing with another vessel in moho that shouldn't be a problem but the return to kerbin is looking more and more dubious but it's going to have to be a future episode in which we learn of the fate of Moho 3 because this episode's not about this vessel. It's about this vessel. This is the Moon Harvester, which landed on the Moon 25 game days ago. And since then it's been busy not just collecting ore but also refining it into liquid fuel and oxidizer. Now, there has been some mix-ups with electricity once I got to the night side, but that's been all kind of resolved now thanks to proper use of the fuel cells. Well, speaking of which, we can turn the cells off now that the sun has risen. I don't have... Uh, oh, I'm still in... I'm still time warping. There we go. <laughs> I was still time warping there. So now I have a stop fuel cell button. There we go. Stop. There we are. Okay. Now, the fuel tanks are almost full. I'm just topping up the ore levels. I want to bring up as much ore as I can. But I'm watching the Delta V being provided to me from Kerbal Engineer. I don't want to collect so much ore that I won't be able to get this thing back into lunar orbit. Alright, so I'm down to about 915 meters per second of Delta V. Let's stop the ore collecting process. I mean, this is going to be plenty. All I want to do is get into orbit. But there's no reason to make the margins tight. We'll refine a bit more LFO just to top up what was used by the fuel cells. And we'll just time warp until our tanks are full. Oh, this is going to take almost no time. There we go. And we got just a little bit over a thousand meters per second of delta v that is going to be plenty but we're going to have to wait a couple of days because i do want to rendezvous with yoy station it's going to be a couple of days until we are underneath that station's polar orbit and about the same time that we have this liftoff window well there's something else that's going on that's going to have to take priority here we have the Korion one getting ready for its first arrow breaking maneuver we saw this last episode this vessel docked with minmus driller 2 passed over a little bit of fuel also did some adjustments on the engine so that hopefully it will uh fly a little bit better now and it's now 19 days after that rendezvous the Korion had to go all the way back out in its trajectory and now it's back to kerbin where it's going to be doing some arrow breaking passes to help itself slow down so that it can rendezvous with Kerbin Station. And while this is happening, you may have noticed a bit of a change in the aesthetics this episode. One of the things that I've been finding increasingly annoying in this series is the slower and slower frame rates that I've been getting as my vessels have been getting larger. 
In an effort to reduce this, I've removed all of the beautification mods. So no more environmental visual enhancements, scatterer, planet shine, or real plume. Actually, that's not quite true. As of this moment, I have no more real plume, but if you might have noticed, I did have real plume going for that Moho 3 burn that you saw at the very beginning of this episode. The Corrine here is going to have to do several more of these passes before it's ready to do its rendezvous. But why don't we instead jump back to the moon? Oh my gosh, this thing is heavy. Okay, let's pitch over. We're going to be going straight north to get ourselves into this polar orbit. And wow, this thing really wants to fall over. I gotta pitch it back up. We are not accelerating quickly. I went back and I checked. This thing is actually 48 tons heavier than it was when I landed. And I can definitely feel it. Part of that might have to do with those large ore containers up there at the top, but I don't know. It, it really wants to fall over. And the SAS is hold, not holding on to it. And if you look, I don't have the autopilot buttons there on the left either. I don't know. Something, something, something feels off with the SAS. And I suspect the remote tech flight computer just definitely feels like it has a hand in this. Let's turn that on. Alright, it says it's off. But still, I don't know, it's just toggled off and on the SAS there. It's no better. I decided to give attitude control to the flight computer. It seemed to want it anyway. There we go, that is 10 by 10. And I would love to set up my rendezvous now, but alarm clock is letting me know that the Korion 1 is rapidly approaching Kerbin's atmosphere for its third arrow breaking pass. So best deal with this. But once this was over with, it was back to the moon to set up that rendezvous burn, which ended up being about two and a half hours away. I got a feeling I actually just missed <laughs> a better window. But that is once again entirely too close to when the Korion is due back in Kerbin's atmosphere again. So I went back to the Korion once it was at Apoapsis and pushed its periapsis out of the atmosphere. Sorry folks, you're going to have to hang in there just a little bit longer and let me get this rendezvous out of the way. Now there is no RCS on this thing. And right now, that's feeling a bit like a poor design choice. <laughs> but it is what it is right now. So, what we're going to have to do is get Burrick and Wilman back into the Korion 3. And they're going to have to come out and meet with the Harvester. Notice SAS is working normally on the Harvester now. Just leaving this scene and coming back to it seemed to have fixed that problem. Now, last episode, last time I used the Korion 3... I was complaining about the WASD keys and saying that they weren't working. And they're working just fine now. And I do have a theory. <laughs> it's a rather embarrassing theory, to be honest. Now remember again, the, the uh, gameplay from last episode was filmed six months ago without commentary, so I really am just kind of guessing, but, well, here's my guess. I think I was trying to use the WASD keys while I was still under a bit of time warp, like a five times time warp. And of course the controls don't work when you're under the non-physical time warp, the regular time warp. And I think I was like, just being stupid. <laughs> I convinced myself that it wasn't me being stupid, it's the mole mod that's stupid. And uh, convinced myself for the rest of that part of that mission that WASD wasn't working and so didn't use them. Ah, uh, that's the best I got. Anyway, we are docked. And uh, what this contract requires is that I put 2,150 units of ore into orbit about Kerbin. So we'll start this all off by transferring all of the liquid fuel from the harvester into the Korion. The Korion's nuclear engines don't require any oxidizer. And then we'll start up the Convertitron 
to make more liquid fuel. I want to make sure that the Crian has what it needs to achieve a Kerbin orbit and then get back here to Yoy Station. Now the ore that I need to take to Kerbin's orbit are in those large forward ore containers which I have turned off. So there's no danger of that ore being converted by mistake, so that means that it's safe for me to go and deal with other things like for instance the Karayan 1, or time warp to my heart's content. Oh shoot, we're full! <laughs> oh, I hit M by mistake there. Oh man, I got caught asleep at the switch. Okay, so we'll uh, decouple the large tanks here from the rest of the harvester. See what we got. Oh, we got 1400 meters per second to play with. That's plenty to get the job done. Setting up the maneuver node turned out to be a couple of days from now, as we had to wait for the plane of our polar orbit to line up with the moon's orbit around Kerbin. In the meantime, the harvester will continue to just refine ore, it still has. And I can get back to the Karayam 1 and get its periapsis back into the atmosphere so it can continue its arrow breaking passes. But you know, just bouncing between two missions in an episode, well, that just isn't my style. In episode 116, the Duna 1 here was inserted into orbit about Ike and has now completed its low-res altimetry scan of Duna's oversized satellite. Now it's time to put it in orbit about Duna. Because of the 73 second light delay, the burn is being handled by the remote tech flight computer. Oh man, this tech is old. This vessel left Kerbin a long time ago. Okay, there we go. Let's see what we got. The orbit is intentionally eccentric and inclined to help facilitate getting into the necessary polar orbit about Duna. Let's take a closer look at the parameters that the contract requires. The orbit has to be circular, an altitude of about 380 kilometers, and an inclination of about 84 degrees. I decided to first create a node at Apoapsis to get the periapsis and hopefully the inclination right. Again, this is largely eyeballing this inclination, but I guess that looks okay. The burn was performed only an hour and a half later. Nope, the periapsis requirement just went green, but not the inclination. And according to Kerbal Engineer, my inclination is 82.5 degrees. I'm 1.5 degrees off. Well, can't say I didn't expect that. Oh, we got a message here. We have entered into a suborbital space flight above Duna. Oh, the periapsis must have dipped down real low during that burn. Oh, sure, I'll take it. <laughs> anyway, the next burn was going to be made at periapsis, which gave me enough time to complete the air braking maneuvers for the Karayan 1 and get it over to Kerbin Station. It has been a long time since we've been here. Oh, Bartner, Stella, Bob. Well, that's right, I left them here researching. Got a bit of a wobble happening, so I made sure to turn off the torque and all those reaction wheels, but uh, I will deal with station attitude later. Oh, 381 science. Well, yeah, we might as well transmit that. Well, this is going to take a little while. Electricity is not going to be an issue. Okay. Well, while well, that's going, why don't we look at who else is here? Oh, yeah, Carol. And then, of course, Valentina, Jean Lee, and McNand just got here. Man, this is quite the crew. 381 science and research. That's not bad. You can see what two level three scientists can do if you leave them on their own to do their work for a while. You know, no one would keep track of this kind of stuff but me, but Bartner's current mission began in episode 68, 218 game days ago, which puts him in a class of his own for mission duration. Though considering I do have four Kerbinauts currently on their way to Drez, clearly that record is destined to be shattered. Anyway, we'll fuel up the Karine and we'll leave her and her crew here. I don't have a mission in mind, but you never know how they might be useful. In the meantime, we can get ourselves back to Duna. 
Alright, so hopefully this burn will do it. It, it. I find these parameters on these ScanSat contracts kind of a pain. I mean, the, the altitudes seem to give you a fair amount of leeway, but the inclinations are so tight. I mean, the inclination has to be between 83.9 degrees and 84.3 degrees. I mean, that's tiny. Anyway, we are coming towards the end of the burn here. We'll f find out what happens. Okay, well, most of it went green, but not the inclination. And Kerbal Engineer is telling me my inclination is 83.3 degrees, and it has to be at least 83.9 degrees. Ugh. Oh, well. I ended up fixing this at the equatorial ascending node. Note that we have no signal here, but it doesn't matter. Um, the reason is is because I created the maneuver and pushed the execute button on the flight computer while I did have a signal, and then the flight computer can take over from there. So that's uh, kind of a neat thing that is, I guess, one of the tiny assets <laughs> that comes with using remote tech is, is that ability to execute a maneuver even though I don't have a signal. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's it. All our orbital parameters are green. Still got to do the scanning in order to finish off the contract. And that, of course, will take some time. Oh, I don't like the way the solar panels are oriented towards the sun, so let's fix that. We got a time warp, though, until we get a signal first. And then we'll use the flight computer to adjust our attitude. Okay, there we go. We got ourselves a signal. Uh, let's see here. I'll get in here. I'll put the heading at zero, so it'll be along the north. A pitch... Well, I should really know what my latitude is in order to decide what my pitch should be. Well, I need the surface data. Get that from Kerbal Engineer. Latitude's about 24 degrees and increasing. Oh, we'll put it at 25. Oh, no, no, wait, that's the heading. Wait, wait, this one. <laughs> 25 degrees, and execute. Oh, no, it's not execute, silly. Uh, custom. <laughs> it's a custom, yeah. Executes for nodes. Okay, so, time warp away the light delay. And then we'll see what this looks like. Okay, about 10 seconds to go. Five, four, three, two, one, and well, that works. Yeah, 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 that's good enough. Yep, that's plenty. That that'll work. Okay, so all we got to do is let this thing do its scanning, and that leaves us with just one last loose end to tie up. You know, my original idea for this was just to sort of, because all I got to do is orbit Kerbin, so my original idea was just to stick my nose out of the moon's SOI, therefore orbiting Kerbin, then just turn right around and burn back towards the moon, but then I realized there's a more efficient way to do this. The moon has a period of six days, two hours, and 40 minutes, so I want to put myself into an orbit that has a period about Kerbin of half of that. The idea being that as I do two orbits, the moon will do one complete orbit, and after I do two orbits, I should be coming back and meeting once again with the moon. So while I'm doing this, I'm watching my time to apoapsis and time to periapsis, and I'm just subtracting them as I go. And I'm looking for that to be one day, three hours, and 40 minutes, which is half the period that I want to have. So all we got to do is time warp our way out of the moon's SOI, and this should complete the contract. Oh, geez, now that this is going to take well over six days, not to mention the two days they've been actually already floating on, this is turning into an eight-day mission. Oh, I feel sort of bad. I left Shalcal behind. Shalcal's all by himself in Yoy Station in the science lab, researching away. Oh well, poor Shalcal. Anyway, here we are, and the contract is complete. Awesome. According to Kerbal Engineer, my period is three days, one hour, and twenty minutes. Pretty much it. 
We'll set up a maneuver at Periapsis to get our moon encounter. So a little bit of retrograde, and then we'll hop ahead in orbit. Oh, wait a sec, I need that other menu here. Yeah, I want to go up to the bigger time increments. There we go, hop in orbit. Oh, there it is. Exactly as planned. Let's zoom in here, but this is looking pretty good. Oh, yeah. I mean, this will take a little bit of tweaking, obviously, but... I have no doubt I'll be able to turn this into a nice encounter. And so six days from now, we'll be returning that sweet, sweet ore back to the harvester and making ourselves some more resources but you know that's going to have to be for a future episode in the meantime I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time